Hello everyone, thanks for stopping in. Today we're going to be talking about Math 121, Section 5.1. And for this section, we're going to start off with a couple definitions. So first, a random variable is a variable, hopefully that makes sense, that has a numerical value that's determined by chance, determined by chance from a given procedure. So for example, rolling a die is a numerical value that's given chance. So if I let x be the result of my die roll, I don't know what x is yet, right? It's a variable, and its value is determined by chance. When I roll the die, I determine the value of x, right, by chance. Maybe x is, oh, looks like it's 4. That's a random variable. A probability distribution is a table, graph, or formula that gives the probability for each value of a random variable. It's a table graph or formula that gives the probability for each value of a random variable. It tells you all of the outcomes and all of their associated probabilities. So for example, I made a table for my die. In my table, I would have the numbers one through six, right? That'd be one column. Those are my outcomes. The probabilities are all one over six. So if I made a table, it would, you know, have the outcomes and the probabilities. We'll also look at graphs and formulas briefly, but that's the, the basic um, outcome. We want tables mostly, tables and graphs, a little bit of formulas. Now, a discrete random variable, technically I shouldn't need to define this term. We know what a random variable is and we know what the word discrete means. A discrete random variable is a random variable that is discrete. But if we want to remember, a discrete random variable has a finite or countable number of outcomes. Think rolling the die. Or maybe my discrete random variable is how many rolls before I get a five. You know, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, how many rolls before I get a five? That could be infinite, but I can count them, right? It's finite or countable, discrete. We've seen discrete before. Same with continuous. A continuous random variable has an infinitely uncountable, has an uncountably infinite number of outcomes. And maybe human body temperature. That is determined by chance, right? First, different humans have different body temperatures and different conditions, you know, different procedures, whether bacteria or viruses are present in a body, affect a body temperature, right? If I want to think about my probability distribution as body temperature, then that's a continuous random variable. Now, if I want to create a probability distribution, or if I want to know if something is a probability distribution, it has to meet three requirements. First, the first requirement is probably the most obvious, but there is a random variable, and usually we use x. There's a random variable. That might seem silly, but that's the first requirement. You need a random variable. It's not a probability distribution if you don't have a random variable. And remember, random variables are numerical. They have a numerical value. Second, the sum 
of all of the probabilities of x should equal 1. If I add up every possible probability, I should get the value 1. Right? If I add up all the outcomes, that covers the whole spectrum of outcomes, I better total it up to 1. Or 100%, right? Or the sum of the p of x's, if you're using percentages, should be 100%, right? Probabilities take either 1 or 100% for all of the possibilities. Sometimes you might get 0.999 or 1.001. .001. That can be okay because of rounding, right? Sometimes rounding might cause you to have, you know, a really close answer, like 0.999 or 1.0001. .001. Those are close enough, right? Sometimes if you round, you might be a little bit off, but technically they're supposed to add up to exactly one. But because we round, we might be a smidge here or there off. And then lastly, for each value of x, 0 has to be less than or equal to p of x, has to be less than or equal to 1. Each individual probability, each individual probability has to be between 0 and 1. They all have to be probabilities. And so let's re-walk through this list really quick. First, there is a random variable. Second, all of the probabilities add up to 1. Third, each of the probabilities is itself between 0 and 1. You know, maybe you have 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0.3. All of those would be fine, right? They add up to 1. They're between 0 and 1, right? We can look at these um, values. If you're using percentages, this would be 0% and 100%, right? But usually we use decimals when we're working with probability distributions. So let's look on the next page. And we're going to do an example. First, let us consider tossing two coins with the following random variable. x is equal to the number of heads when two coins are tossed. So get a picture in your head. You got two coins in your hand, and you're going to toss them. You're going to flip them, right? And then you're going to count how many heads come up. First, confirm x is indeed a random variable. So let's think about it. Is x a random variable? First, is it numeric? Well, yeah, it's the number of heads I flip, right? How many heads do I flip? Well, I could flip 0, 1, or 2, right, if I'm flipping two coins. So first I confirm that x is indeed a random variable. And then I construct the probability distribution for p of x. So first, x is a random variable. It's a number that's determined by chance, right? So I determined x as a random variable. Now, I'm going to want to make the table. And I'm going to put the table over here. And it's going to be x and p of x. X is my outcomes. How many heads can I possibly flip on two coins? I could flip zero, one, or two heads on three coins, right? Those are my three possible outcomes. I can get zero heads. That's if I flip double tails, right? I could get one heads, or I could get double heads, right? Those are my possible outcomes. Those are my possible values for X. Now, I need to find the probabilities. Now, for this... I'm going to need to do a little bit of outside work, right? I'm going to need to do a little bit of outside work. I'm going to write down all the possible flips. I could flip heads, heads. I could flip heads, then tails. I could flip tails, then heads. Or I could flip tails, then tails, right? That's the sample space for flipping two coins, right? I can get heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. Those are my possible answers. Those are my possible values, right? possible outcomes. Now, p of x. p of x is going to be equal to the probability of zero heads. Well, there's only one option that gives zero heads, right? And that's this one. And it's one out of four. One out of four, which would be 0 0.25 as a decimal, right? Now, how many of them have one heads? Well, there's two that have a single heads, right? There's two outcomes out of four total outcomes, or 0 0.5. The probability of flipping one heads on two coins is half the time, right? 
Then lastly, how many of them have two heads? There's only one outcome that has two heads, so that'd be one out of four, which is again 0 0.25. If I add all of these up, it gives me one, which is good. Each of them is itself between 0 and 1, and x was indeed a random variable. This is my probability distribution table. I have my x values, my outcomes, and their associated probabilities. Now, we've got a note here. What does 0 plus mean? Well, 0 plus just a quick note, 0 plus is when sometimes you might divide a number, and it might be too small to work with. Let's say I have 1 in 99,999,999, right? So it's really unlikely. If I type that in my calculator, it gives me 0. I know that that is not really 0, but my calculator says it's 0. It's because the number is so small, I can't actually tell what the decimal is with my calculator. You put zero plus then. Basically, this means it's a number super close to zero, but it's not actually zero. So zero plus is a number super close to zero that's not actually zero. Think like 0 0.0000000001. You might just write zero plus instead. And we'll see that sometimes in tables. You might see the value of zero plus in a table, which basically means it's possible, but it's super unlikely, right? Now... We said there are formulas. We made a table here, right? Let's look at a formula for the coin toss. So the coin toss, the table for the coin toss was this, right? That was the table for coin toss. Now we could also write the formula, and here P of X is equal to 1 over 2 parentheses, 2 minus x, close parentheses, exclamation point, x, exclamation point. And here, if you have a number with an exclamation point, it tells you to do that number times 1 less than that number times two less than that number, and so on and so forth until you have two times one. So for example, six exclamation point would be six times five times four times three times two times one. So you multiply in descending order until you get to one. So one exclamation point would just be one and zero exclamation point is also equal to one. So the exclamation point is just an operation. Now let's take a look at one of them. Let's see what P of zero would be. P of zero, so let's do it in red. P of zero is equal to one over two parentheses, let's see, X is zero. So I'll plug in zero. Let's see. I'll get one over, I got to do the parentheses first. I have two times two, right? Two minus zero is two times zero with an exclamation point on it. Now I need to figure out what these exclamation point numbers are. Well, it'll be one over the first number is two times two exclamation point is two times one, right? It would be two times one. Two exclamation point would be two times one, which is two. And zero exclamation point we said was one, which gives me one over two times two times one is four. One over four, which is exactly what P of zero is, is one over four. So notice the formula corresponds directly with the table. If you plugged in one, you would get 0.5. And if you plugged in 2, you would get 0 0.25. Now, this formula is a little bit complicated, isn't it? Whereas the table was quite simplistic, right? Formulas and tables might not necessarily conflate. Just because a formula is easy or difficult does not give an idea of whether the table 
or the graph is easy or difficult, and vice versa. Flipping two coins is an easy procedure to conceptualize, but it's a hard procedure to come up with formulaically. Formulas can be both complicated or simplistic, and it does not necessarily matter based on your procedure. So keep that in mind. So that's an example of a formula. Now, I would not have you derive this formula. It would be given to you if you're going to work with a formula, right? I would give you the formula for the probability distribution. You wouldn't be expected to come up with this formula. Like, where did this come from? It's, it's a little complicated, right? Where did this formula necessarily come from is a little bit messy. And we're not going to focus on that. That's not the important thing from this chapter. The important thing isn't how to come up with these formulas. The important thing is understanding what are probability distributions. Understanding that you can write tables, formulas, and graphs. We won't really look at graphs in this chapter because we'll be looking at those in chapter 6. Let's look on the next page. Companies were asked to determine the biggest mistakes that job applicants make during an interview. The data is collected in the following table. But is the table a probability distribution? Why or why not? Well, there's actually two correct answers. The first correct answer is, it is no. It's not a probability distribution. No. Because the sum of the P of X's is not one. What is the total? It's 1.57, right? The probabilities do not add up to one. These probabilities need to add up to one. So that's one reason why this doesn't work. Now there's actually another reason. The other reason would be no, because x is not a random variable. X is not a random variable, right? Is inappropriate attire a numerical value determined by chance? It might be determined by chance, right? When you select a job applicant, what they show up in is random, right? But what they show up in is if they show up in a t-shirt or a suit, those aren't numbers, right? Inappropriate attire is not a number. X is not a random variable because it's not numeric. Remember, you need numeric. So either of these would be a fine answer. Now, it actually did meet the third requirement, right? Remember, the third requirement is that each x value is between 0 and 1 for its probability. That was true, right? But you need to meet all three requirements in order for it to be true. If you fail even one of the requirements, you are no longer a probability distribution. So keep that in mind. Probability distributions have to meet all the requirements. Now, are probability distributions a population or a sample? Which are they? They are a population. They're a population because we list all outcomes for X. We have the whole population, right? If I'm thinking about rolling the die, I know the population of outcomes is 1 through 6, right? I know I can't roll a 7. I know I can't roll a negative 4. I can roll 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. I have the whole population here in my hand, right? Probability distributions are population data because we know all of the data, right? It's not a subset of the data. It's all the data. So we'll use population symbols. We're going to use population symbols for it. It's a population. So let's get some formulas. Let's get some formulas for our probability distributions. The first formula is for the average or the mean. What's the average outcome? That's what this is determining. You have a probability distribution. What's the average outcome? On a die, it's three and a half, right? If I added up all of my possibilities and divided by six, I would get three and a half. Right? If you want to think about that for a moment, it might be a good time to pause. If you add up all outcomes on a die and divide by 6, you'd get 3.5. But what's a formula for this? Well, the formula is the sum, and then in brackets, the things we're adding are x times p of x. That is the formula for the mean. Notice I use mu because it's a population. Next is the variance. 
variance is sigma squared, right? The formula for the variance, well, I'm adding up x minus mu squared. This should look familiar. This is part of our standard deviation table, right? This chunk here. Now, I'm going to add a p of x uh, multipli uh, multiplication and then close my brackets. So I'm going to add up all of these values. So I need to do some calculation for the variance. And then the standard deviation, well, that's equal to the square root of whatever your variance is, which is equal to the square root of the big formula we used for the variance. However, for these problems, we will calculate the variance first and then use that to find the standard deviation. We'll use this first formula that you can take the square root to get the answer. Now, technique for finding these parameters. Remember, parameters are population data, right? The technique for finding these parameters is step one, create a table. You'll be given, most likely, a probability distribution, right? And what I always do is I add a few new columns. I add an x times p of x column, and I add a x minus mu squared times p of x column. I just add two columns to my table. And then step two, I complete the table. And then step three, I total A and B, right? I find the total here, A, that'll give me the mean. A will equal the mu. A will be the mu when I total it, right? If I total up the A, I'll get the mu. And if I total up the B value, I will get the variance. And then I can find the standard deviation, right? I'm going to complete this table. I'm going to total this column and this column, and that will give me these two values. Then for step four, I can find the standard deviation. Step four will be find the standard deviation. I can take the square root to get the standard deviation. Now, once again, just like with standard deviation, when we originally saw the idea, working through the table in our first example will be much more enlightening than just seeing it written here. So let's wait and we'll see this again in just a moment when we do our next example. Now, expected value is another definition. Expected value is the expected... And I'm going to put quotation marks around the word expected. Outcome for a given procedure. It's the expected outcome. The formula, we use E for expected value. E is equal to the mu. Expected value is just another word for the mean when talking about probability. The mean outcome is the expected outcome. Now, be careful. E may not be a possible outcome. Just because it's the expected outcome does not mean it's possible. On the dice, we said the average value on a die is three and a half. That's the expected outcome is a three and a half. I, I can never roll a three and a half, right? But it's still the average outcome. So, I need to keep that in mind, that just because I can never roll a three and a half doesn't mean the average outcome isn't a three and a half. Now, let's do an example. 
Let's actually look at this. Use the probability distribution for flipping two coins from earlier. So first, let's copy that down. We had x and p of x. Earlier, we calculated these values to be those numbers. Now, if this was a question, you'd either need to first come up with that table, or second, it would be given to you. One of those two things would need to be true, right? You need the probability distribution before you can do any of these calculations. So we're trying to calculate the mean, variance, and standard deviation. So here is where we're going to add those other columns. So what I like to do is extend my table and the first extra column is x times p of x. And then the second extra column is x minus mu squared times p of x. I add those other two columns. Now, I need to fill in this table. I'm trying to calculate the mean, variance, and standard deviation. This table will help me. The first column I need to complete is x times p of x. Now, the reason we do this is because I can just multiply left to right. 0 times 0.25 is 0, right? x times p of x. 1 times 0.5 is 0 0.5, right? x times p of x. And then last, 2 times a quarter is 0 0.5 as well. So I did x times p of x for each row. Now, I need the mean to calculate this one, right? So, well, let's see. What do I get when I total these? Remember, I like to put a little uh, sum symbol here so I know I'm totaling it. 0, 0 0.5, and 0 0.5, if I add those together, I get 1.0, right? I get the value 1. So my mean is equal to 1 heads, right? The units would be heads because I'm flipping coins, right? And I'm counting the number of heads. The average outcome would be 1 heads. The mean outcome would be 1 heads. Now, for the next part, I'm going to write the algebra out. I'm going to write, let's see, x is 0 minus the mean, the mean was 1, right, x minus 1 squared times, and then p of x is 0 0.25, 0 0.25. And so let's see, I've got to do 0 minus 1, 0 minus 1 gives me negative 1, now I need to do negative 1 squared, negative 1 times negative 1 gives me Let's see, times negative 1, oops, gives me 1, right? Negative 1 squared gives me 1. And then times 0.25, we got to do a little bit of algebra, it gives me 0 0.25 when I multiply everything together. In my second row, let's see, x is now 1. The average is still 1, and that'll be squared times p of x. p of x for this row is 0 0.5. 0 0.5. So I'll do 1 minus 1 first. 1 minus 1 is 0, right? 0 squared is 0, right? 0 squared is 0. 0 times 0 is 0. And 0 times 0 0.5 is 0. So I get a big fat 0 when I do that algebra. And then for the last algebra, let's see, I've got 2 minus the average, which is 1 squared times, let's see, p of x. p of x is 0.25. Let's see, 2 minus 1 is 1, right? 1 squared is 1. And then times 0.25 will give me 0.25. Now, I'm going to put a little sum symbol here because I want to add up this column as well. Quarter plus zero plus a quarter is 0 0.5. So this tells me the variance is equal to 0 0.5.
and we're measuring heads. And remember, variance is units squared. What's a head squared on a coin? I don't know. It doesn't matter. The unit does not need to mean anything. You just need to make sure the unit has a squared on it because variance is always units squared. Now, I need to find my standard deviation now. Well, for the standard deviation, I'm going to take the square root of my variance number, 0 0.5. I'm going to take the square root of that number. 0.5 square rooted gives me 0 0.7071067. Now, I want to round it. Let's see. My original probabilities, well, it's a probability, right? It doesn't matter what my original, probabilities are three decimal places. So it'll be 0 0.5. 707 maybe, right? Three decimal places if I wanted to. If a question tells you how to round, make sure you round that way, right? And we're measuring heads. So my standard deviation would be 0 0.707 heads. So my expected outcome is one heads, and I have my variance and my standard deviation. I can now use this data to draw conclusions about my procedure. And we'll be doing that in later chapters. We'll be looking at some of these values. We'll be using some of this information to help us. So probability distributions. Notice the table helped me stay organized for finding my values. So I've got one last question. I calculated mean variance standard deviation. What is the expected value and what does it mean? Well, the expected value would be equal to the average one heads. And what does it mean? Let's think about what it means for a second. The expected value is one heads. That means if I flip two coins, I should expect to get one heads. That does not mean I will get one heads every time. But if I were to flip two coins a thousand times in a row and divide the number of heads I got each time by a thousand, I should get one on average over the course of many trials, right? The expected outcome would be one. The more trials I repeat, the closer the average trial should be to the expected outcome, right? It doesn't mean I'm going to flip one heads every time, right? It just means my expected value is one heads. Now, let's take a look here. Let's do a real-world example. We're doing craps versus roulette. We're betting. Ricardio has $5 to bet at the casino, and he knows he wants to place one of the following bets. He either wants to bet on the number 7 in roulette, where he has a 1 in 38 chance of winning, and the net profit is $175. So that's his first choice. Or two... He wants to bet on the pass line in the dice game of craps, where he has a 244 out of 495 chance of winning, and the net profit is $5. So he's got different odds and different profits. Which of these bets is better? We're looking for the better bet, right? I.e., which of these bets has a higher expected value? So I'm going to need to look at these two different examples. We'll look at number one, and then we'll look at number two. Uh, sorry, we're going to put the number two over here so we have more space. For the number one, I have an X. And I'll also have a P of X. And then I'm looking for expected value, so I'm going to want to just put X times P of X here. The question asks me nothing about variance or standard deviation, so I don't need this last column. This column here is calculating for the expected value, right? It gives me the average outcome. I don't actually need the variance column, so I'm going to avoid it for now. Now, my x value. I have two options in betting. I either win or I lose, right? I either win or lose. Now, these are not numeric, so I need to figure out the numeric values. Ricardio has $5 to bet. If he loses, that would be a value of negative 5, right? Negative money. He'd lose $5.
negative 5 is a number. That is okay. And you can get negative numbers in your probability distribution. Negative numbers are okay. Now, if he wins, how much would he win? He'd win 175, right? He would win 175. Now, his odds of winning were 1 in 38. Right? His odds of winning were 1 in 38. Now, as a decimal, 1 in 38 is 0 0.0263157. I'm going to leave the fraction there as well, and we'll put 0 0.0263. <coughs> that's his odds of winning if his odds of winning are 1 in 38 his odds of losing are 37 in 38 right 37 in 38 so 37 out of 38 oops gives me 0.974 uh, Zero point nine seven four, and we'll go an extra decimal place for a seven. We'll go to four decimal places when we're writing it down. Zero point nine seven four seven. A little bit small, a little bit hard to read, but we need to make sure we have the decimal right. Zero point nine seven. Oh, sorry, three seven. Zero point nine seven three seven. Right. Zero point nine seven three seven. Now. X times P of X, let's see, in the first one, 175 times 0 0.0263 gives me 4.6025 for my X times P of X, right? I multiply 175 times 1 over 38. You could have also kept it as a fraction, and then, you know, we could have looked here at the value as well. Either way would have given us the same information. Now, in the next one, negative times a positive is a negative. So I need to make sure I have that. 5 times 0.9737 gives me negative 48685. Negative 4.8685. So I get my two different values and so now I need to add them together but I need to be careful one of these numbers is negative so when I add them together 4.6025 plus negative 0.8685 when I add them together I get negative 0.266 I expect, or sorry, Ricardio expects to lose about 26 or 27 cents. His E is negative 0 0.266. He should expect to lose around 26 cents every time he plays roulette. That's how casinos make money. Your expected value at a casino is always negative. Always. Otherwise, they don't make money, right? That's how casino games work. Your expected value will always be negative for any casino game. So he expects to lose that much money in this game. What about in craps? That was for roulette, right? Now, craps, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do X. And I'm going to do X. Or sorry. P of X, and then I'm going to do X times P of X. The same thing, right? I'm trying to get the expected value. Here, if he loses, he loses $5 still, right? But if he wins, he only wins 5 bucks here. He only wins 5 bucks when he wins, right? Now, he has a winning chance of 244 over 495. 244 over 495. 244 over 495. 244 over 495 is equal to 0 0.4929. 4929, right? 
0 0.4929. Now, his probability of losing would be the opposite, right? So if his probability of winning is 49.29, his probability of losing would be 1 minus 0.4929, right? I can subtract. That'll give me 0.5071, right? Winning and losing are opposite probabilities. So 0 0.5071. You also could have looked at, let's see, if he can win 244 of the times, then he must lose the other 251 of the times, right? Because 251 plus 244 is the total 495. You could have done it either way. I personally like taking this and subtracting it from one because I know there's only two outcomes, right? When there's two outcomes that are opposites, their probabilities must add up to one, right? These two needed to add up to one, so I know what this one is if I know what this one is. Now, let's get our x times p of x. We got 5 times 0.4929 gives me... 2.4645, and then the next one will be negative, right? Because it's 5 times 0.5071 will give me negative 2.5355. Make sure you're being careful with the negatives. Now, I need to total this last column, right? Let's see, 2.4645 uh, 2 and 253. Uh, 5, 5, let's see, will give me 2.4645, will give me negative 0 0.071. So he expects to lose here, he expects to lose around negative 7 cents. He expects to lose about 7 cents each time, right? I'm going to put a little 2 next to that E and a little 1 next to this E because there's two different E's, right? We want to make sure we remember this one goes with this one and this one goes with this one. So either way he's losing money is his expected outcome, right? That's how casinos work. We should have known ahead of time these would both be negative. Now we've shown they're both negative. Now, which one does he expect to lose less money? This one, right? This is a higher number, right? Remember, with negative numbers, the smaller number is actually bigger, right? So this number is actually the bigger expected value. So which of the bets is better? It's the craps bet. The pass line bet is better. So if he's trying to win the maximum amount of money he can, if he's trying to minimize his losses, he should play the craps game. Now... If his plan is to win big and have, like, an awesome winnings, it might be better to play roulette. If he's trying to just play one game and get a big win, you know, all or nothing sort of strategy, maybe not the best. But that's not what the question's asking, right? The question's asking, which is the better bet? It's smarter to bet on the craps table than the roulette table here. And notice, I didn't need to know anything about how either game is played. I know nothing about roulette or craps for this question. All he needed to do was know the numbers. And that's true for most statistics, right? We actually don't need to know the real life scenarios. We just need to know the numbers and we can calculate the data. That brings us to the end of this section. Thank you all for joining in and I will see you next time.